okay um well there will be a few more people arrive but i i i think i think we've i think we we will kick off and i would um therefore like to say well he hello everyone and a, a very warm welcome to our second national health and care analytics conference and the fourth and penultimate event in our series of online e-labs anatomy of a waiting list how well do we understand our waiting lists i'm rachel caswell i'm an analyst in the strategy unit and i've been involved with the planning of hacker 2024 which celebrates the outstanding work of all health and care analysts, bringing them together with leaders to showcase how analysts support high quality decisions. And last year's Hacker was a huge success. I hope you I hope you were there. And this year is even better with almost 180 abstracts. We've designed an amazing program with inspiring speakers, interactive workshops and posters too. And this is all centered around our theme of exploring the what how and why of analytics. So before I hand over to our guest speakers, I'd just like to remind you of a few little bits of housekeeping. So if you could keep yourself um, muted during the session, but do say hi in the chat and possibly where, where you're calling from and also use the chat box for any questions you have for our presenters today. Am I actually sharing my screen? Let me share my screen. Otherwise, you're looking at me and I can't have that. I'll give you something else to look at. So this is just a reminder of what um, I've just been saying. And these sessions are being recorded and will be on the website in a couple of weeks or so. And do tweet or do any form of social media that you like about today's session. Apparently tweeting isn't for everyone these days. Um, but what we want to see is magenta all over the place. And that is what we would like to see during the session and, of course, following the session as well. So, in today's event, we have, um, and I'll be delighted to hand over to our speakers in a minute, we have Neil Walton, who is a professor in operations management at Durham University, and Tom Smith, who's an insight manager from Nottingham University Hospitals NHS Trust. So, Neil and Tom, hey, over, over to you. Okay, Go for it. You. Thank you so much yeah, and thank you everybody for coming along today. I'm just going to quickly uh, share my screen. So this is uh, a talk on the anatomy of, uh, wait, of a waiting list um, and to explain a little bit what this is about. It's a project. Um, so my background is a mathematician who works in queuing systems and obviously um, one of the big issues of the moment is the NHS waiting list. So I wrote a, a paper, a sort of white paper explaining sort of some of the basics of queuing theory in the context of the NHS. Uh, this was conducted where I had sort of had an honorary contract at the Manchester Foundation Trust and then some of these things got written up and used by some people within the trust. And then I gave a, a talk with, with Rachel um, kindly hosted and and a few people uh, so Tom Smith who talked today uh, were interested in this and, and thought it would be good to try and essentially take some of the formulas and some of the ideas from that and make this into a, a an R package so it's accessible to different people around the country so they can essentially um, uh, understand the key metrics and performance measures and understand essentially if their waiting lists are too long or too short and what they should do if they are too long. OK, um, so that that's the basic uh, agenda. Um, so like I say, there's a, a, a white paper here um, that's available on Med Archive. And also there's a link here. Uh, we'll make the slides available to the uh, NHSR community NHSR waiting list package. Um, the package is in development. Uh, so, you know, like I say, I gave a talk at the end of last year about this, and then this is what we've been doing between sort of then and now, essentially. And the aim is by about November to have the first version of this package sort of freely available to everybody to have a look at. So, so on the one hand, it's explaining some things, but on the other hand, you know, we're, it's a bit of a call to arms, as in, you know, if you're interested, it's an open community initiative. We're happy to have more contributors. Um, you know, if you want to use the package and you want things to be included then you know reach out to us and we'll try to accommodate that okay so uh, for the first few minutes I'll discuss um, a little bit about the sort of 
uh, say more the mathematics and more the, the formulas and the ideas behind that. And then I'll pass over to uh, Tom, who will then explain a little bit about how the package development's going. OK, right. So uh, the, the aim here of this part is to explain some sensible metrics for understanding and making decisions about NHS waiting lists. And then the other aim is to make this accessible through the NHS R community. OK, um, so this is what a waiting list looks like. Um, you have some demand that comes in in the form of, say, arrivals uh, who are referred for some form of treatment. And then there's some sort of capacity here, which corresponds to uh, the number of removals that, say, you're making from your waiting list per week. And then there's the queue length, which is the number of people that are waiting in your waiting list. And then there's the waiting time, which is sort of the length in terms of the time it takes from an arrival to happen to come to the bottom and then be served and leave. OK. Of course, this is a little bit of a simplification of what real waiting lists look like. The reality is, is that we have different priority groups. So we might have like P2 priorities, which need to be seen within a month. And we might have like AMBA P3 priorities that need to be seen within, say, about 12 weeks. And then we have like P4 priority uh, patients who need to be seen within, say, a year. And then when we do procedures and operations on them, we need surgeons and nurses and uh, we might need anaesthetists and other people like this that come in together. So this is a, what we're working with is a simplification of these systems so that we can get the basic metrics out. OK. All right, and a running example we're going to have, uh, which is ENTP4s. Uh, these are sort of semi-realistic numbers from Manchester. Um, they're not exactly what the numbers are, but what we have here is we have a queue, a waiting list for e in P4, uh, priority four group ENT people. There's about 1,200. Um, the number of people who've missed their target is about 61%. Um, the mean waiting is 63 weeks and we need it to be lower than that to be about 50 it needs to be below 52 weeks okay um the demand so that d that i mentioned earlier is about 30 patients per week and the capacity is 27 patients per week okay and then another important met metric is the variance uh which i think is actually square root of that so about about 40 or so but um and then we have the, the the first thing you'll notice um, is essentially that the demand here is bigger than the capacity per week. So in principle, what's happening is you're adding three people to your waiting list every week. OK, so where we think about that as queuing people uh, is that the load, which is the ratio between the demand and the capacity is bigger than one. So we have this metric called the load. OK, which essentially just uh, gives you the amount of work per arriving per unit time to the waiting list. And if the road is bigger than one, then the queue is um, then you're going to be constantly adding to your list. And then we're going to be in this situation over here where the waiting list is just going to grow indefinitely. OK, and the only way that it'll get shorter is essentially by people re requiring other treatments or being removed because of uh, more serious illness. OK. So the first metric that I mentioned about is the load, uh, which is just simply the demand divided by the capacity. And that needs to be less than one. And then if we can achieve that, then what's going to happen is the queue size or the waiting list size is going to sort of bobble around according to some sort of random process. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is what does that random process look like? How do we measure it? How do we understand it better? OK, so the first thing, regardless, is that you need to get your demand to be less than your capacity by either increasing capacity or by rerouting people and managing the demand in some way so that it's less than one. OK. So here's an example uh, of Manchester over the pandemic. Um, here you can see the P4, uh, P3 and P2 priority customers here. And we can look at the queue size. And what I can draw here is the line horizontal across here, of how long the waiting list should be so that you're making your targets with high probability. OK, so I'll explain a little bit how we calculate what the waiting list length should be so that um, you're making your making your waiting list targets on average. OK. Um, so the idea is that um, so one thing that I'll mention about uh, is in terms of this load here. Um, the, the time that the queue is empty or not being worked on is always one minus the load. OK, um, so this comes with a warning uh, here that essentially if you want to have low waiting times, 
then there must be some not negligible fraction of the time where services are not being used. OK, so I've explained this in the context of ambulances. You need ambulances running about 60 percent load. So that you get low waiting times by this by the other, say, 40 percent of availability. OK, so there's this fundamental trade off between the load, the amount of time that you're continuously working and the waiting times. So sometimes we get in the NHS that we're, that you're told that you need to be working all the time and that's the, going to be the system's going to be efficient, going to be more efficient that way. Well, actually, it's not what's going to happen is if the load gets too big, then the waiting time's going to get long. OK, so you need to have the sort of spare capacity at all times in order to cope with that. OK. Another thing you'll notice on this slide, I'm starting to pop in a few little bits of snippets of code. Um, these are things that have been implemented now in the NHSR waiting list package. And so just to give you an idea of how these things are implemented, if you are going to be working with them um, with the NHSR package. OK. Right. OK, um, so let's suppose you've managed to get the load less than one. Let's suppose that you're not your waiting list isn't growing indefinitely. Um, let's have a think about what the distribution of waiting time should look like. Now, if we think about uh, people in general, we think of we probably if you've got sort of a data science background, you probably know about the normal distribution, like say the distribution of heights of people in this telephone call is probably normally distributed. If we did a histogram of it, it'd have this sort of nice sort of bell shape. OK, and the question is, well, what what's the distribution of waiting lists? If I took a bunch of waiting lists with the same load, what would those distributions look like? OK. So, so like I say, if we plot a histogram of heights, it'd be normally distributed. But what would happen if we plotted a histogram of waiting lists? What would we get? OK, uh, and like I say, you could play around with this yourself with the simulation tool that we've got in the NHSR package. Well, what it would look like is have an exponential distribution. OK, so we learned in the pandemic a lot about exponential increases in terms of R and the pandemic. We're waiting this. This histogram would go down exponentially fast, so multiplying by a factor every constant that we go along okay so what this means is that say if we took the mean waiting time and then we doubled it then the probability would go down by a multiplicative factor if we then went up by another factor of two it would then multiply down and multiply down and so essentially this distribution goes down quite fast okay and so then if we wanted to have control over the probability of being above some waiting time, then we have to we have to understand that the mean has to be some multiplicative factor lower than uh, our target. OK. So so um, and just to just to show you, um, this is an example. So this is from the huddle I gave earlier uh, last, late last year. This was the distributions of uh, waiting times in uh, the Dudley NHS group, and you can see this is the distribution of waiting times uh, from the available NHS data. And then here's a fit to an exponential distribution. You can see it fits pretty closely. And if you look across the whole of the country, pretty much every hospital you come across is going to have this sort of exponential fit to waiting times. The sorts of things you start to see is one, you have these little dips at about 17 weeks. Why? Because the nationally reported statistics are 18 weeks. And so there's a sort of a little bit of a panic at 17 weeks where people get removed. And the other thing is sometimes you get sort of with some of the waiting lists when the government says we have to reach targets for tails, sometimes it gets a little bit cropped because there's been some intervention that's been introduced, but eventually it'll just settle back down to this exponential behavior. So it's just sort of temporary fixes and things like this. OK. Um, so, um, so given that um, this shape of this exponential distribution, um, if I was, to if you were told the target that you were going to meet, okay. So think of it this way: let's suppose those E and T people um, were wanted to be seen in fifty-two weeks. Yeah, you would think that. Well, you could try to get the average waiting time at 52 weeks for people on your waiting list. But then what would happen is like half of the people will be less than 52 and half of the people will be over 52 and that'd be very bad. OK, so then the question is, like, let's suppose you wanted a chance of, say, 2 percent or 0.2 percent that someone goes over 52 weeks. OK, well, well, what that's going to mean is you need the average weight to be actually like a multiplicative factor of about four to six less than the target weight. So actually, if you want, like, say, a 2% chance 
that somebody in your waiting list uh, goes over 52 weeks, then you need the average wait here to be about 13 weeks. So 52 divided by four, okay? So you always need to be a multiplicative factor lower. So please don't try to make your targets, your average wait, close to your target weight. They need to be a factor smaller, like a quarter smaller, okay? Again, you can do the calculation with that with our with the with the package. OK. Um, another thing is how, how did I draw these nice lines? Um, so there's a rule called Little's law um, that says if I look at my capacity here and my demand here, then there's a relationship between the average queue size and the average weight and the demand. The average queue size equals the demand times the waiting time. OK, so this is quite useful in, in, in the Manchester data and will be useful generally. So you can look at your waiting list and you can say this is how many referrals I'm getting per week. And you can say, well, this is how long the waiting time target is. So it could be, say, 13 weeks that you want to reach. And then from that, I can tell you what the average queue size should be in your list. And I can say, is it like bigger or smaller than it than it should be? OK. Um, so uh, so using Little's law, we can actually calculate like a target queue size, what the queue size, the number of people waiting in your waiting list should be. And then you can tell you and then with that, you can tell how much every waiting list is away from its target. OK, um, so for the ENT example earlier, um, the target was 52 weeks. And I said that the mean actually needs to be a multiplicative factor smaller so that you get, say, a 2% chance of going over target. So we're aiming for about 13 weeks for the average person. And the demand was 30 patients a week, OK? And, uh, oh, sorry, small type of this would be 360. Uh, so the target mean Q size should be uh, 360, so 30 times 12, OK? But then the current Q size, remember, was 1,200. So basically, we're seeing in that list that the Q size is about three times bigger than it should have been in order to make its targets, OK? So you can basically look at each list and say if it's too long or too short and where you should be uh, roughly, OK? Um, this is a typical picture of uh, NHS queues. Uh, they've been in a state of overload and they've got too big, OK? And the kind of calculations I was talking about there are really designed for the situation where you've reached some sort of equilibrium, OK? But really what needs to happen in most lists when they're too big, so say they're twice, three times bigger than they should be according to that calculation. So I counted as say twice that target or three times that uh, queue length. So you need to do some intervention, okay? So what I've defined here is something that's the, the relief capacity, which is essentially something where you can just sort of drain this list down towards where it needs to be based on the amount of time. So, um, you know, like I, I ran the numbers on the whole of, uh, the whole of Manchester and I, my, my calculation was you need about 15% extra capacity to get the waiting list down to normal levels in the next two years. So, you know, we're, we're kind of looking about those sorts of numbers, um, depending on the trust and the specific problems that they're having. OK, um, so so there's a little bit of a calculation that you can do to calculate the relief capacity, which is the rate you should be serving to do go down that orange part of the curve. Again, that's implemented in the package where you can look at your weekly demands, your current queue size, the target you want to reach, and then the number of uh, weeks that you want to do to make the targets. So basically, if the queue size is too big by Little's law, uh, that calculation there, then this gives you amount of uh, capacity you should do in order to reach a safe level, OK? So um, in our ENT example, we could calculate the relief capacity. It's our demand. Oops, sorry. It's our demand uh, plus some additional factor. Um, so essentially, um, what you found in that example is you need to do about double the number of operations per week uh, to get to a safe level over 26 weeks, OK? Uh, which might not be feasible for a number of NHS trusts, but at least gives you some numbers on what needs to be done to reach these kind of target levels. OK, uh, obviously you can do it over a slower period than uh, six months. Uh, and so, you know, we're looking at some of the lists. It's more like a year, two years to get to the levels that they need to be. And other ones might be more easy to treat immediately. OK. Um, so then what do you do if your queue is not too big? So if it's in a reasonable level, 
Um, well, then we can use this thing called Kingman's formula, and this is a generally useful formula um, uh, for um, working out what the average queue size and what the average waiting time is. In general, a queue behaves like, say, the, the variance in the demand plus the variance in the capacity divided by the difference in the capacity and the, that, the demand. OK, so basically, the bigger your capacity is compared to your demand, the smaller the queue size is going to be. But also, the more you can synchronize uh, capacity and demand, the less your queue size is going to be. So um, some of the things we're seeing in the Manchester data was that the scheduling of operations weren't very well synchronized. And so you get these sort of jumpy, noisy uh, capacity here. OK, and so if you've got a more regular timetable that's more regularly removing operations in line with the demand, you're going to essentially have a small queue size. OK, so basically the variance in your demand and capacity matter. Um, but we can also use this to calculate if you know your variances in from your data and you know your demand from your data, you can work out what your capacity is. So the number of operations you do per week in order to reach some target level on average. OK, um, so there's a formula for doing that. Um, it's implemented in the package where it can say if I want to reach uh, this target queue size on average in the long run, then this is how many operations you need to be doing per week. OK, um, I'm also starting to implement a bit where we can say, let's say I want to reach this uh, threshold. So I, I let's say I want to go over the waiting time target, let's say 1% of the time or 2% of the time or 0.5% of the time, then what is the number, the capacity you should be doing in order to, to reach that on average? OK. Um, in its target range, uh, this is a way that you can allocate uh, uh, capacity number of operations per week in order to reach targets with high probabilities. OK. Um, so particularly in that ENT example, though I may have scared you that you need to do 60 operations per uh, week to reach the target levels, the thing is that once you're at the target level, uh, the calculations say that you actually only need to do 31 operations per week on average uh, to reach targets uh, with high probabilities. So actually you only need a little bit more. Once things are stable, you only need a little bit more than the demand, but you need to consistently do it. And you need to be consistently measuring that. But if you can always be one over the number of operations per week, you're actually going to be doing pretty well. Um, so you only need one operation per week more than the demand in this case to make targets in the long run with high probabilities. OK. Um, of course, um, one of the things you might find is that this is useful for looking at one individual waiting list, maybe uh, according to specialty or according to hospital trust or according to maybe even OPCS code. Um, but often what's happening is you actually need to make comparisons between different lists. So a surgeon might work on several lists and then you need to make a decision which one to work with. Or you might want to reroute some patients from one hospital to another hospital or from one trust to another trust. And then the question is, how is there like a currency we can use in order to measure which lists are most in need compared to other ones? And then we can start to make some of these trade offs and decisions. OK. Um, so there is, there is a calculation for that, which one can do, which is called the pressure, or we call it the waiting list pressure. Uh, and there's several reasons why this is a good thing to do. But the, basically, the pressure on a list is the mean waiting time uh, divided by the target weight. OK. And if we just multiply that by two, then essentially, if the pressure is less than one, this will mean that the waiting list is roughly on target. And if the pressure is bigger than one, then uh, then the waiting list is probably too long. But you can essentially do this pressure calculation for any list or any combination of lists that you like, and it essentially gives you a currency to compare different lists. OK, so um, you might find, you know, an example would be that maybe like urology, you know, so we had like a, in, in Manchester, they had like a high volume, low complexity facility at Trafford following the pandemic and then you can essentially use the pressure metric to measure which lists are under high pressure and then could be then rerouted to that new facility uh, to do uh, their procedures. And so it gives you a way of ranking the different lists in terms of their needs. OK, 
Um, so yeah, and again, that's implemented in in the, in the R package. Okay. Uh, so the ENT example, um, which was uh, the mean weight was 61 weeks, the target weight was 52 weeks. So we found that ENT P4 had a pressure of 2.3. However, if we look at ENT um, P2, uh, the pressure is 8.8. .8. So essentially, um, what we were finding, what you can find there is that there's been a big uh, emphasis to take care of long waiters in the NHS. Um, and so emphasis has been put on the P4s, but actually if you look at higher priority people, they're actually waiting much more higher multiples of their targets uh, compared to the long waiters. And then what you could find here is, for example, the pressure uh, with and shore is like closer to 10. So the, uh, something that someone might want to do is reroute some of these ENT patients from Withenshaw to another facility and maybe to think about prioritizing these P2s ahead of the P4s. OK, of course, if it was the other way around, if the P4 pressure was eight and the P2 pressure was eight, then you'd want to prioritize the P4s. Uh, and, uh, and so it gives you a way of deciding which which lists are most in need. OK. There's certainly more that we could do uh, that, that we can think about in terms of the package. So optimizing scheduling, workforce planning, analysis of theater provisions. Also, we can do things that are not waiting lists, but say bed, bed occupancy, something where there's a fixed capacity or number of beds available, looking at rotors. There's lots of things that we could do in the pipeline. So one of the reasons for giving this presentation is to kind of reach out to people and to get an idea of what the needs uh, of the different uh, uh, NHS analysts are. Um, uh, and just to explain, um, so yes, again, there's a copy of the, the, uh, the, the sort of white paper here in MedArchive, please have a look at that. Um, there's an NHS, I'm sorry, there's a YouTube link to the previous huddle where I go through some of these calculations a bit more in detail. And I'll also add that pretty much all of the calculations I've, I've given here are pretty standard queuing theory results. So I'm not trying to introduce anything that's particularly controversial. Uh, so, you know, sort of standard operations management textbooks would contain pretty much all of the calculations that I've, I've uh, described there. OK, and I'll stop uh, for questions uh, now whilst I hand over to Tom, who'll talk a bit about the package development side of things. So if there's maybe time for one question just while I pass over to Tom. The, or maybe there was a, a question in the chat. I'm I'm just checking now. I think we didn't have questions as such. Um, we have somebody who's used little little. Um, okay, before. great, brilliant. Um, <laughs> Pleased to hear it. <clears throat> um, and and a request from Tom to say um, t test drive the NHS um, uh, our package. So I'm sure that'll happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. Gu guaranteed. Um, and then there's. Uh, yeah, there's a, more more observations and questions at this point, so I think we can move on, Neil, and okay, we'll, we'll, right, yeah. we'll pick up the questions at the end. Okay, I'll pass over smoothly to Tom now. Thanks so much, yeah. and uh, Thank, thanks, Tom. Fab, brilliant. Hopefully you can see some slides on the screen there. I did have some IT gremlins just now. I thought I was going to have to join from my phone, but can someone give a thumbs up if you can see slides? Brilliant. Okay, so... Um, this section is just to talk about the um, implementation of, or the beginning of the implementation of an R package. Um, it's a collaborative piece between Neil, who's providing, you know, the expertise and the knowledge, and a group of people, probably about 10 people actually, from the NHSR community. Um, and we've decided to, to build a package to help um, use the, the, the work that Neil has just uh, described. So let's move. So what, what I'm going to spin through today is, is why are we building a package? A little bit about the concept of the package, some internal detail about how it's structured and how it works, and that's hopefully to kind of um, help people get involved if they want to. A little walkthrough of how it currently stands. It's not finished, but we can show you where it is today. And then a little bit of sight about what the next steps are. So that's the plan. Um, in terms of why an R package, so Packaging something up in R is a brilliant way to, to kind of uh, make something fast, flexible and reproducible. So that, that's the first thing. And, and we can encode the better practice that Neil's just sort of taken us all through 
we can embed that within the package and make it accessible to a much bigger group of people um, once that package is available for use. Um, R gives us brilliant facility, not just for calculation, but also for pr production of really, really high quality reports through things like our Markdown and Quarto. So it, it, it doesn't have to be dry kind of report material. It can, it can be actually very rich report material that makes it very, very accessible to interpret the information once it's computed. Um, a package can be extendable. So this particular one is open source. It's MIT licensed. Um, it's written by a group of 10 or so people in the NHSR community, but it, it can also be owned by you. You know, the code is yours. You can pull it down and you can start to modify and extend it um, to your own use and hopefully contribute um, back into the package. Because if you find something useful, it's almost certain that other people in the NHS are going to find it useful too. Um, and then the final aim is it was around community building. So no one on this earth has, was born understanding how to collaborate on GitHub. I certainly wasn't. And so we've been, as a group, we've been going through that, that journey, sort of learning uh, how to collaborate, how to um, build something collaboratively through GitHub together. So those were our aims. Um, but in a nutshell, what we want to do is to codify a good thing. So there's an image on the top there that shows sort of a lo lo laboratory scale experiment growing into a bigger pilot, growing into a sort of a facility wide demonstration, growing into widespread use. And that's really what we'd want to try to encourage. We want to codify a good thing, make it efficient to use and make it easy for people to use on a wider scale. That it, it should, should help scale it up. And, and then hopefully we'll be able to influence good decision making on a much wider basis than just one or two people who understand this method already. Um, that's, that's the idea. In terms of the, the vision for the package, this is a little bit of a, um, an overview of what the package does. So it runs from top to bottom. So you can see that at the top of the screen in the green box, that's basically the minimal data set that the package needs. As Niels just explained, really all we need to know to compute this information is a list of referral dates and a list of removal dates. So that little data frame up in the top left hand corner there, that represents a waiting list of two people. Um, two of the people have, have got a removal date, so they're no longer on a waiting list, they've been processed. But two of them don't have a removal date yet, um, and so they are still on the waiting list. Taking just those two columns of data, hopefully times, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of rows, um, you can take that minimal data set and you can put it into the package. And from that, you should be able to get two outputs. One on the left is the, the visual output. So some nice reports that summarize where, where we're at and where your waiting lists are at. Um, and then on the right hand side, probably some data frames, which uh, will come out of the package as well. So some, some tabular information that you can use for onward processing, or you can use to um, feed whatever whatever other activity you, you, you've got that, that doesn't currently sit within the package. You can, you can extract the computed information out and use it however you want to. So that's a, a really, really high level um, summary of, of what the package aims to do. The box at the top right in the yellow is, is important later. So the, the green is the minimal data set. So that's that's what you need to define some of this stuff. But actually, it becomes very useful when you when you add in these additional categories on the right hand side. And those are just examples. There can be many, many possible uh, categories you could add to a, to a given patient's waiting um, status that, that later on we can we can cut in many different ways to make things much more useful um, and, and much more deeply useful. So, the data frame outputs, which is pretty much where the package is now, we haven't done the visual outputs yet, but the data frame outputs are shaping up. Um, let's take um, a group, so a specialty. For each specialty, as Niels uh, mentioned, we can calculate the, the high level metrics. We can, we can look at what the overall pressure is. We can look at mean demand and mean capacity over the period of time that the sample data exists for. We can look at load, so that, that measure about is it, is it greater than one, i.e uncontrolled and likely to be growing indefinitely, or is it less than one, which is where we want it. Um, we can look at what the target queue size is for a given service level and what the actual queue size is. Um, we can look at mean waiting time and we can look at that variation coefficient that, that Neil talked about. Um, if you have a smooth and level system, 
you probably can get away with a with a smaller capacity than if you have a lot of variation in that system. So that's um, that's where we're at now. Um, and then this slide really describes the the potential power of, of where we want to get to. So th that image at the top there is lifted straight from Neil's presentation, which is the concept of the NHS is a complex machine with many, many lists within lists, and you can cut it in lots and lots of different ways. Um, and we have to cut it in lots of different ways to fully understand our problems. Um, so if we attach that categorical information to the to the to the raw information that's going into the package, in addition to just the waiting list additions and removals, we can potentially study our lists in lots of different dimensions. So we can study them by specialty, an obvious one. We can study them by priority, by diagnosis code or procedure code, potentially by diagnostic test. So um, irrespective of specialty, you know, how do, how do our cues stack up as they stream into particular diagnostic tests? Um, we can we can cut them up by patient age. So, you know, do we have a, a relatively large or smaller problem for younger patients or for older patients or for you know patients in the middle of the population demographic? Um, and we could also potentially look at temporal analysis. So uh, let's say we're working with a specialty that's that's made a, a very concrete in, intervention and, and improved their specialty in some way. We should be able to um, look at that raw in, uh, raw referral and re removals information um, and infer quite quickly whether that's made a, a measurable difference to the performance of that specialty. So um, we can really put numbers on that um, and, and judge it with with actual data rather than with, yeah, it feels better now that we've made that change. You know, we can we can actually put some metrics on it. Um, and then finally, we can look at bottleneck investigation. So, um, probably a subject for another day and maybe something that Neil knows an awful lot more about than I do, almost certainly. But the bottlenecks in the NHS are likely to be the expensive things. They're not people like me. They're, they're the clinical staff. It, it, the bottlenecks are the theatres or the diagnostic test information. And so understanding where, where a particular specialty has particular bottlenecks is, is key, because um, if we do work to improve an area that isn't a bottleneck process, um, we may not actually improve the throughput through that area. Um, we're, we're sort of tinkering on the sidelines and expending energy tinkering on the sidelines without actually making a, a difference. So the package won't directly solve that problem, but hopefully it will start to um, kind of expose that, that type of question to, to the users of the package. There's a little bit of internal package structure here just for those who are potentially minded to, to get involved. So. The package on this slide is is the dotted line and you can see at the top we've got data coming in in that raw format and at the bottom we've got some beautiful reports um, and probably some data frames as well. Um, initially you will use just a wrapper function which is called WL stats and then what that wrapper function does is it calls out to the, the key functions within the package so uh, the most important ones are the ones that Neil's already mentioned those six core functions in the white paper um, those are the ones that actually encapsulate the research and encapsulate the method um, and do the heavy lifting. There are some helper functions as well. And once that is all sort of calculated up, um, that wrapper function will then pass out to some report generation functions, which will basically make the pretty outputs, whether they're tabular or whether they're R markdown or quarto. There'll be some report generation stuff that happens to, to, to create some outputs. Um, at the top of this slide as well, you can see a data simulation um, section. So let's let's say you're not ready to use the package yet. You just want to have a play with it. You want to download it, have a play with it. Also within the package, there's um, some ability to simulate data. So you don't have to put your own hospital's data into it. It's actually um, potentially tricky to get hold of the right information set. So if you just want to evaluate the package, you can um, effectively create your own synthetic data using a couple of functions within the within the package um, and then you know simulate the outputs for that synthetic data. So this bit is just a little walkthrough of um, where the package sits at the moment. So I'll click out actually to a um, ooh, excuse me. So 
the package has got a, a, um, a website, which we'll share in, in a moment, but one of the parts of the website is this, is this example walkthrough. So Neil's presented the white paper already, um, and this portion of the website is basically a walkthrough of that white paper using the package functions. So hopefully having seen the first half of this presentation, you'll recognize some of this. The numbers should be identical. Um, we walk through load at 1.1. This is using, using the actual package code um, to compute um, the results. Um, and then on top of this, obviously, we'll have those wrapper functions that, that, that um, make it much friendlier to use. So you won't have to call six individual functions to step through a problem. But you can call those six functions if you want to. And if, if you want to, this, um, this walkthrough does just that. Um, so hopefully that's accessible to people. It's on public internet and available now. Um, it's probably worth mentioning also that the, the package is very much not finished yet. Um, let me get my, here we are. Um, it's very much not finished yet. So as I mentioned, the, the core computation is done, but the report generation stuff is not yet done. And that's what we want to do next. So what's next? Um, the aim of today partly is to sort of tell you where we are, um, hopefully spark a few people to um, potentially get involved and contribute some feedback or get directly involved in helping with the package or just ideas um, would be great. Between now and September, we're going to be continuing to write code and documentation to support the package. Um, and the aim is, in October, November time, we want to have the first version out there ready for people to use. Um, that doesn't necessarily need to stop you having to play with it now. So that, that command at the bottom there, git clone, if you want to pull the package code down as it currently stands, you just run that git clone command in your in your um, terminal and that you, you'll, you'll get the package as it currently stands and you can have a little play with it. Um, and that's the first step to sort of contributing to a bit of code writing with us. Um, so yeah, development continues, and if you can contribute um, or have any uh, any suggestions, please do um, get involved. In terms of more information, there's the the code is on GitHub, as I mentioned, it's MIT licensed, so it's public. The documentation is also on GitHub there, and one of the primary ways to get involved is probably the discussion forum within GitHub as well. So if you go to GitHub, that link there will take you to the um, discussion tab and just open a new thread or con start contributing to a thread that's already there and um, we can take it from there. All welcome, please do um, get involved. My email address is there, but um, yeah, just get stuck in. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Um, I'm thinking you've come to the end of your presentation so we can take a few questions. Yeah, we have. Um, and because I'm um, I'm hosting this. I can choose my own question first. Um, <coughs> but, it, but somebody said it was a fab question, so I'm going to ask my first question. Uh, and it's a question for Tom. So it was really um, around: Could you use the um, the tool, the approach to look at health inequalities, i.e., looking at looking at it by deprivation? So you talked about all those slicing it all those different ways, gender, I think. I just got an Amazon delivery. I'll just pop myself on mute. Yeah, so in answer to that, yes, you, you definitely could and um, arguably should use it for that. Um, that's one of the more, I guess, one of the more advanced use cases um, because um, a, a lot of trusts may not may not be may not be doing even the even the basic sort of whole population study yet. But yeah, that's very much one of the categories that you could study it by and cut awaiting this by. So yes. Yes, it, it isn't necessarily um, the first thing that trusts look at when they're um, um, trying to reach waiting list targets and uh, and so on. Um, but uh, nevertheless, very important that. But maybe, they, yeah, exactly. Maybe it should yeah. be. And I, I guess, yeah. you know, the aim is to make it much easier to do that uh, through this this type of work. And I, th I think if 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 uh, trusts are able to do it, then they they will if they have confidence in what they're seeing in terms of how it's being sort of described and measured then it will give them that evidence to say well actually we can tackle health inequalities in in this way um totally biased i've background in public health so i'll i'll um um full disclosure <laughs> kind of 
the question around, so I'm, I'm starting at the most recent one as opposed to doing them in the order that they've come through. There's a, there's a couple more questions and not too many. Um, so please do pop your questions in, in the chat if you do have any further questions. Somebody is asking whether this could be applied to A&E waiting times as well. Uh, I don't see a reason why you couldn't. I guess you need the data of just when people yeah. arrive and when they move, but there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't look at if you get the data for when people arrive and when they leave. Yes, in principle, yes. Uh, the, the, the way the package is written is mostly done in terms of days rather than times, but yes, mm -hmm. there's no reason why you couldn't. I don't, I don't see why not. Yeah, um, could, could, could be minutes and and seconds, couldn't it? It could be, yeah, could be yeah. any unit of measurement. Yeah, yeah. and there's definitely researchers who work on A and E specifically for, but, but in principle, the, the, the principles are the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Tom, not this Tom, another Tom um, has asked, is the mean weight in the pressure calculation, the mean weight for patients on the current list or the mean weight for waiting list removals over a recent period? If I've read that wrong, I've read it it, 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 it would be in the current list, the mean okay. waits in time of the people that are there at the moment in the list. Yeah, yeah, that are waiting for, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Rather than the kind of long run wait over old people over the last year or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and there's just a, a question just been uh, popped in the, in the chat. It's quite a long one. So if, if you can see the chat, it's the penultimate one. Can you can you see the chat? I can read it to you if, if that's if that's easier. Which one, Rachel? I'm you... going to read it. I'm going to read it to you. I'm being a terrible host. Uh, it, it says <laughs> so. Uh, either, either the person who typed it can can read it out, or I can just read it out. I'm going to go three, two, one. It's going to be for me. Uh, so all of the data you are using in the model is submitted on a weekly basis by your trusts as part of the waiting list MDS. I can't help. I can't help thinking, wouldn't it be useful if someone at national or regional levels were using the data sub we submit with this model to analyse where high pressures were, this is sounding good, uh, and where relief is needed. So this is a, an aggregation and using it for a, for a different purpose. Do you know if there are any discussions in regards to this rather than all individual trusts doing, which is fair enough, wouldn't it be great if the submission were submitted um, was used for something useful. So that's that's sort of using it in a different way. So I, I suspect it could be used at an individual trust level for, for managing waiting lists, but also on an ag aggregated level to determine sort of maybe targets and where the pressures were more um, collectively. I mean, so, so, so certainly yes, and, 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 and definitely, like I say, when I was, I'm, I'm not in Manchester, but when I was in Manchester, I did sort of, we had rather more bespoke weird code with the mixture of SQL and R and other things. Mm -hmm. um, but it was possible to run the numbers on the whole trust. Um, you know, so in principle, yes, you can, which is why I was saying this sort of 15% over two years kind of um, is about the right, you know, 15% extra capacity over the next year or two is about the right amount for that trust. So you could in principle do that with all the trusts. I mean, yes, that, that that's fine. And, and, and definitely those sort of exponential fits that 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 I mentioned earlier that those can be applied just from the yeah, the national level data, if you see what I mean. Um, I think some of the national reported statistics tend to be, um, tend to not include when people arrive, but how long they've been waiting for, if you see what I mean. So it's more like there's someone who's been waiting one week, two weeks, who doesn't say that someone waited zero weeks and arrived. So there's, there are some issues with the, the national level data. And then the other issue with national level data, well, my, my, my personal thing, it's like, you know, all, all the priority targets aren't 18 weeks. So why do we, I don't understand why, <laughs> why why 18 weeks seems to be the target. And and you, you can see it in the data that there's this dip at 17 weeks, which has been changed by the way the reporting mechanisms work. So, but yes, there should be, there should, in principle, it should be possible to do that. I mean, there's, there's the, that would just be take you know in principle like 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 tom was saying you could take all the arrivals and removals from an entire trust and just run it through it might be a bit yeah. slow and it would probably need to be work on uh writing efficient code that does that, that runs that quickly but in principle it would be possible yeah and I suppose it would give that uh, i mean i'm sure obviously that there's there's people from the national team on the call today and um 
approaches are used. If I looked at my messages, they might they might sort of might flag those. Um, but it would give you that kind of um, those. You'd be able to answer certain questions like, well, what what age groups are are we seeing, which are mm. predominantly sort of influencing this, um, and just just look looking at it in those different ways, which would probably give more as as well as getting the 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 broad sizes right as to what the, a realistic target and the realistic sort of um was it re relief activity i think you called it to get to a position where that could be achieved sort of longer term so i'm sure it, i'm sure it'd be an extremely useful to, tool uh, to be able to uh, and answer lots and lots of questions and set uh, or inform realistic and useful Sort of, sort of targets but there is that problem not a problem that it's uh, having it at that level would be very useful having it at the trust level at the specialty level and yeah. to, to be able to manage manage those waiting lists be able to really get to the bottom of um what is influencing th these tales what is going to make the difference and where do we need to focus our, our attention locally is, is also very very important so both both angles very important um, yeah and if i if i jump in just really briefly sure. there so, so I'm sitting in a provider trust in Nottingham, but I, I yeah. don't speak for the whole trust. Actually, I sit in a little outpost of, uh, I'm in one of the six clinical divisions in family health. And I'm, I'm not trying to apply it to the whole trust even. I, I no. really want to apply it to the specialties that sit in my division. So yeah. the two primary cuts, well, the, there's probably more than two, probably four. My specialty is very interesting to me. So are we allocating our, our kind of critical capacity resource effectively across specialties? Um, my patient age is important because w yeah. we have the children's hospital sitting within our within our um, division, so that's an important question. Cancer, non-cancer is important as a question because obviously cancer is a really, really um, urgent treatment pathway and has different target treatment times. And at the moment, we don't have a brilliant way to understand how we're doing there. Um, and then ethnicity is also something we, we really do want to get to sooner rather than later. And, you know, looking at health inequalities and that sort of thing. So that in a microcosm, in my little corner of the trust that I work in, that's really why I've chosen to sort of help try to develop this package is because I really want the answers to those questions. And at the moment, I don't have a good way to, to get them. Absolutely. And I think what's, what's really sort of um, fascinating about this really is the, the the clarity this is this is my perception when I get confused easily by everything um, the clarity in which you can describe the 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 numbers on the waiting list and how they behave and the ability to sort of sum, summarize that information and show it to somebody who you actually want to do something with with that information so you're able to describe it in a in effectively in, in a in a convincing way. And you can say to somebody, a, a commissioner, a decision maker, whoever is responsible for uh, elective activity and the changes in that, if you do this, you can achieve this. 100 percent. You know, you, I, we, we, we have the, the numbers don't lie. The, 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 we have confidence if you do this and this, this can be achieved. Um, so I think I think that's very powerful. I'll just I'll just have a quick couple of couple of the questions um, before I um, sort of start start to close this down. Um, there's a comment about could it be applied to diagnostics waiting and of course we've kind of covered that because we 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 understand that it can be applied to any data any waiting list if if you have that data they could be useful you just maybe change change the metrics um is there another question that i have missed there's a, i saw a few so so yeah. um one okay. one was about um missing data uh and okay. I, 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 that might be more of a Tom question than a me question, but in, in principle, yes, you'd need some level of correct data. I don't know if you could remove sort of null entries and things like this, but yeah, then then the, yeah, there's there's some sort of requirement of data quality. I guess we could write it in the package where you remove any sort of dead rows and things like this. Yeah, just um, add, add it to the guidance. Uh, there's there's a question here about uh, is it better to um, calculate required demand to maintain steady state at a service provision level and aggr you, aggregate it to a trust. I suppose you could do it either way, couldn't you? You, you could cut it either way. I haven't written it that way, but I could, <laughs> I can, uh, we could that's a great, great question actually, because we could add that to the package if, if one wanted to do it, say, this is our capacity, this is what the demand needs to be to make, 
I'm, I'm sort of a little bit cautious that that's coming into what a clinical decision rather than a uh, you know what I mean what pathway someone sits on but 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 um but yeah I mean principle one could do that uh, I think this is this is the kind of um sort of feedback that you're going to be really wanting isn't it so as you as you develop the as you develop the model and people's how people use the model um if people have questions that they would like it to answer maybe it for it to behave in a different way or use it in a different way I'm sure you'll be wanting people to feedback on that so they can jump on that github and sort yeah. of um, th throw that into into the into the chat there, or, or contact you directly. I imagine. Um, There's a question. One here. really good question that we might have yeah. thirty seconds for, which is about. Okay, go for it. This is your last yeah. question before I before I close. Yeah, it says Met metrics you've made look clean and straightforward, which is great. However, I'm wondering how chaos and noise, so patients cancelling procedures, strikes, get factored into the computation of target patients seen per week. That's a good question, Neil, because that speaks to the variation. Yeah. It, yes, I'll exactly. So it. if there's noise in your demand or your capacity, then that that's bad <laughs> for your waiting times. Yeah, you want a so constant you, demand. It would, it would, <laughs> yes, it would be factored in those yeah. those covariation terms. Um, striking would affect the demand. I mean, we that that would. I mean, we, we we leave it to the to to you guys to decide what your demand is and what your capacity is, or you just give us the data, and then it just takes the data as it is. So it's not that we're sort of assuming people are on strike or not. It's just this is the removal data, this is the referral data. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're adding in things to do with um, people who remove from their pathway as well that's something we're working on at the moment so that that gets added in but yes definitely we're trying to add as much of those things as possible um whilst trying to keep things simple in terms of so yeah it's reasons. a balance um, it's a balance yeah. isn't it you don't want it to be over complicated and not be able to explain it to anyone yeah. okay well i think we're just about to hit um at 11 o'clock so i'd just like to um I'd like to thank you, Neil, and yeah. Tom, for bring, bringing waiting lists to life. I'm really, really enjoyed And, and do, do get in contact with us and go on the GitHub page. This is as much a call to action as it is, you know, it's not for us to decide. So just, you know, get in contact or download the package. Uh, if, if you're thinking of using it, then get in touch. You know, we, we want more people can help the better. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, thanks. That's good. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just yeah, it's it's been a, it's been a, a really really great session. And thank you all for for coming to this session as well. <clears throat> and I'd um, like to just make you aware of our final our final e lab. Oh, this is so sad. But this is this is today. So this is uh, one o'clock today. We've got this e, e lab, which is using system dynamics. So I think there's going to be loads of people on the call who would definitely like to come to this one. Now this is in local authority public health practice. So please do come today. Uh, our guest speakers are uh, uh, public health, uh, health consultant Abraham George, Peter Lacey and many others and they're going to be sharing the examples that they have been working on for many years as well. Um, so it's, it's some of them are tried and tested and they're having a real impact down there in Kent. So do come along to that. So I hope you will um, sign up for the rest of the conference and I hope to see as many of you as possible in Telford. Um, if you can't join it online. Uh, we, it'll it'll be um, a, a, an exquisite experience online and, to, and almost as good as being there. Hope to see you there and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Neil, as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank, thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Yeah.